Hey, hi everyone, and welcome to today's session. Today we'll be talking about CLIP embeddings. CLIP uh, stands for Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training. So basically, this is a model that was released by OpenAI in 2020 or 2021. And this basically tries to map the image domain to the text domain by a common embedding. Okay, so, so what's an embedding? An embedding is like a representational space whereby like concepts can be represented as n numbers. And these n numbers form like a vector space. So basically, what clip embeddings do is to merge the world of image and text. So this is quite remarkable because a lot of modern advancements like stable diffusion, doll e, and even some robotic tasks that uses vision use clip embeddings as the basis in order to map the visual domain back to the text domain. And it has quite a lot of success. Yeah, you can see that a lot of um, very nice images are being produced now by Gen AI. A large part of it is because of clip embeddings. So what exactly is clip embeddings? Let's take a look at the uh, a sample notebook that I prepared. So let me just stop my share first and go to the notebook. Can you all see this? Okay, so let me just zoom in a bit for the notebook. Okay, so this is the experiment that I did and I used the transformers library. So actually you can also go to the original clip um, GitHub. Let me just show you. If you want to go to the original GitHub, it's here. It, it does the same thing actually. It's just that this one you kind of need to load the data sets, you kind of need to do a lot of things. And actually for the purposes of demonstration, we don't need to load like Cypher 100 and stuff like that. We can use our own images. That's why we can use the Transformers library. It's very cool. Like Hugging Face has this whole clip already uploaded. You can just download the processor and the model. So what was the difference between the processor and the model? The processor processes text and images to a suitable representation. And then the model then use this representation to pass through in order to get your embedding. So here we use this vision transformer. Um, and what we basically do is like this. So when you have a list of images, and in this case are image paths, and you have a list of texts. Okay, so the image paths are something like this, or your PNG that you put in some folder or JPEG, whatever image you want. Okay, the texts are just like some accompanying text to the picture. Okay, it can also not be accompanying text to the picture, but it's just to show like how accurate the clip embedding is to match the image to text. We use basically this picture, and this is the description of the picture. And we do that for all the pictures. So you can see that uh, in this calculate similarity function that I've created, uh, we can actually um, see what this is, is actually a PyTorch model. So torch.nograd just basically means uh, we don't want any gradient calculations because we don't need to update the model. We're just going through a, a single pass. I mean, you can remove this, nothing will change though. It's just that this one makes um, the calculation like meter so that you don't get the gradient at the end also. So over here, we have the processor. So what we do is we can process. This processor is a combination processor of both text and images. So both text and image can pass through the same processor. You just need to specify what is the input here. So text is this text. And what we will see here is that we have some truncation. So later in the slides, I'll also cover. Uh, OpenAI, the way they train their model is they truncate it to 76 text tokens. So if you want to do some similarity comparison between your text and your image, the text cannot be too long. Okay, if not, it will be truncated. So just take note of this. So we get our text embeddings here as some like, basically the output of the model is going to be the vector embeddings for each text. Same thing we do for images. We take the image, we open the image, and we process it as a, as an array. And then we pass this to the processor. And after that, what we'll do is we'll get back the embeddings as well. So this basically, the text goes to get the embeddings. The image goes to get the embeddings. And then after that, we can do something called cosine similarity, which will compare how similar these two embeddings are. So let's take a look at how this is done. Let me just run this. So we can see that we have this list of matrices. And what this matrix is doing is that every row here represents the image and every column here represents the text. So you can see that this is like 0 0.3267, which means it's quite 
considered quite high similarity because over here is like you can see the similarities from 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 like that. Okay, so you can see most of them on the middle axis here is the highest similarity for every row. Okay, later it's clearer to see in the picture form, but this cosine similarity is basically calculated for every image crossed with every image description. All right. So how is cosine similarity done? It's basically done like this. You take two vectors, you do a dot product, and you divide by the magnitude of the vectors. So here we can calculate the similarity of basically just the first text embedding. We, we just basically take this, this one, this embedding, and this embedding. I'll just show you how this is done. So this is the first embedding. We basically do a, this is the magnitude of the vector of the text embedding. So in order to calculate cosine similarity, we take the first embedding dot product, the second embedding, which is here, divided by the magnitude of the first vector, divided by magnitude of second vector, which is this equation over here, actually. And you can see that what when we run this, we will get this 0 0.32669327. So actually, when we do cosine similarity of the text and the images in a vector space, you can see this is exactly the top left. I mean, I can do this one also. This one is um, image embedding zero and text embedding one, okay? Because um, this is how matrix are displayed. So you can see that over here, this is 0 0.195, which is matching to this. So if I want to get this number here, the index for the row is one, index for the column is one. We can also see over here, 0 0.2511. So I could do a, a for loop to do the, the row and the column and get all the numbers, or you can just do a matrix multiplication using the cosine similarity function, which is provided by PyTorch, and you can get all this. So yeah, this is just an explanation of what the code does. Essentially, we are giving it a list of text and we are giving it a list of images and we are calculating the cosine similarity across all text image pairs. Yeah, um, all clear for this before I move on to the experiments. Okay, so this function was uh, created with the help of GPT and this function basically takes in the image and the text calculates the cosine similarity and then we display the highest cosine similarity either by text or image. So by default, I go by image. So like given an image, what's the best text pair that matches it? And you can also change the text and then it'll be given the text, what's the best image that matches with it? So the de details I'm not gonna go through, you can see it later. So first, all right, let me just run the first one. So these are my images and you can see this image is like the guacamole, this is, uh, this image is, anyone knows this game? <laughs> yeah. And this is seven. Yeah, yeah, correct. This is the Cloud versus Sephiroth. So this is quite, quite new. Um, this is Arif. It's Pikachu. This is an apple. This is another apple, uh, the rainbow. And then this is the one from Amnes. So we just want to see, like, I just mix and match some pictures. Okay, so one thing I want to tell you all is that Clip is trained over 400 million image text pairs. Some of them might already be in the training set, but that's the power of it because they train over such wide uh, variety of image text pairs. It doesn't really like fit into like Cypha or MNIST, those kind of very narrow data sets. It learns features for a lot more broader things. Later we can discuss whether that's good or bad, but it allows it to get capabilities like what you would see in like ChatGPT, where your text may not be like, you may not give enough examples in your data set or in, in your free shot prompt, but it can still do the thing for you because it has seen a lot of other similar examples over the web. And over here, these images, I just randomly picked them out based on my interest. I mean, you can also do your own images. I, I gave you all this uh this code, by the way. Yeah, so you can just put in your own images here, see how well Clip works. Let me know how well it works. Um, So you can see like, at least like guacamole, you know, it matches like that. No, I, I tried this also, like a picture of a mole. Right, because guacamole is guac, there's a mole in there, right? So if you put picture of mole, it's actually quite, quite uh, dissimilar. So it's it's not too bad. Yeah, but I mean, if you try something like a picture of uh, not a guacamole, I think it will do quite badly because like the text embeddings don't really do the not quite well, okay? So this is in my text embedding session, I also realized that um, if you do like, this is a person and this is not a person, the text embedding itself is not able to distinguish very well between the positive and the negative. So um, don't do this kind of thing for uh, text embedding. You don't, don't, put the don't put the negative. Sorry, sorry? One question. Did yep. you provide the 
how the text are, are is generated. Did I write the text? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I created the text myself. Okay. Yeah, you want you can change it, so it's live. You want you want to can change one of the things. So instead of like picture of a fight, we can put picture of uh like over here we have cloud, right? Picture of cloud and Sephiroth. Yeah, you can you can see whether this works. And you see it's still quite high. So it recognizes these two are the, the main characters. Yeah. So this is uh it's quite cool because if you already know, like for example. You can just take the clip embeddings, and if you already know what you want to do with your application, like you want to even do some classification between cats and dogs, you can just put a picture of a cat, picture of a dog, and click will work just fine. Okay, because it works pretty well on ImageNet, which contains cats and dogs. Okay, so you you can see over here most of the embeddings are exactly the highest here, and the rest are quite far away, which is good. Which means that the embedding here is is quite good. Also, uh, except this rainbow apple here. Like the rainbow apple matches quite closely with picture of an apple, which I think is fine because this is also an apple. All right, then picture of a one matches quite well. Sorry, so, can I can I check the what's the second or last column? Uh sorry, text for the text for the text. Rainbow apple and apple. Yeah, for apple, it's also quite close. Yeah, one. but but I think it's okay because this is this is an apple, also, right? Yeah. Okay, so we can see over here. Okay, maybe I zoom out a bit. Uh, I zoom in to let you see, but I think in, to see the whole table, I need to zoom out. So we can also run this. So this basically, instead of grouping by image first, we go by text first. So you can see that over here, uh, most of the things also correspond quite well. Photo of Rakamo, this will be retrieved. Uh, so if you want to do a system where, you know, you want to query over images, you can just type in this text, go through your entire vector space of image embeddings made by clip, and then you take the top K, and then you return those images. I think it works pretty reliably, at least if your pictures are quite distinct. Okay, so you, you want to like search picture of guacamole. You can see what comes back is top K will be like this. Zero point three D will get this, and then maybe you get Apple, which is you know similar domain is good, you know. So it's not bad. A like picture of a fight, you get back this one first, followed by the number one, which looks like a sword. So this actually, if you take top K retrieval for based on text, it works quite well also. Right, so Apple, you see Apple 0 0.31, the next one you retrieve this logo. So it, there's some semantic match between the text and the images, which I, I quite like a lot. So over here, you can see that Rainbow Apple, it, um, it got this instead. Okay, so that's, it's not entirely accurate all the time, but if your categories are distinct enough, and I, I need to emphasize distinct enough, so you can see like Apple and Rainbow Apple, you know, kind of, kind of mix up sometimes. But if your category is like Pikachu and Apple, I think there will be no issues for Clip. Okay, so let's see whether you can do something even more general. So like, instead of giving the original, like most uh, broad description, I give something like a girl. So it's like match this one. And then like a sword matches this, which is great because there's a sword in this picture. And it also matches this, it kind of looks like a sword. So I, I don't fault it. I, I think this is actually good, All right? So if let's say you have a narrow classifier like MNIST, this will be classified as one only. It will never be classified as a sword. So stuff like clip enables you to, you know, zero shot generalize across many different concepts because it has seen 400 million image text pairs, right? A number, it, it, it's not too far behind the number here. So, you know, and a, lo a logo, <laughs> this is also match a logo, okay? So next we have something like a food, okay? So you can see this matches very well with a food. This is very well with food also, which an animal, Pikachu, see, it matches, and a logo, it matches this logo, and it didn't match the apple here. So there's some idea of what the thing is. Um, next, we can run this also. We can run this to see what is, like I tried to see whether it can disambiguate between backgrounds and the image itself. Uh, to my surprise, it could. Yeah, I was quite impressed actually with that. You see, white background. So there might be a data set that, you know, talks about background, or maybe the captions of images in the wow Says so like a person on a white background. So you, you kind of learn the background as well, just from this 400 million image text best. So black background, is it not bad? This one, yes. Colorful background, this one correct. This one actually is a black background, but because of the colorful apple, it characterizes as colorful background. So again, you can see this is not perfect, but in general, it works pretty well. Okay, next. Uh, this is something that I think click doesn't do well. And in fact, all of the vision models right now, they are making a bold click here. 
all of the vision models right now don't have this thing done natively, which is position. Okay, even like um, convolutional neural networks, you take in the filter and you apply it universally across everything. So if you want to get position of where your dot appeared in the image, it's difficult. And in vision transformers, they have row and column embeddings for, 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 for each patch of the image, but the exact position of the image is not preserved, uh, of the object is not preserved. So here we do an experiment. Basically, this is some code. You can change the, the squares that you generate. I generate red, green, and blue squares at top left, top right, center, bottom left, and bottom right of a grid. Uh, initially, I did everything, but just to show the point, I just need five positions. You can try everything also. Yeah, it, it's the same thing. It doesn't do it well. So in red, you see over here. Um, can you see here? This is top left, top right, middle, bottom left, bottom right. You see what's the best match text? Everything is top right. Okay, so what does this tell us? It tells us that <laughs> it doesn't detect position well. Uh, don't use clip if you want to find out where the dog is in your picture. You no, know, you are better off using like a object detection model like YOLO V8. You use that to detect where your object is. Don't use clip to tell you where the object is. All right. It green, is it look at that? Green becomes bottom right. <laughs> Blue is like everything is like <laughs> top right. So there might be some bias in the image to, you know, bias blue to certain text, bias green to certain text, because the image didn't change at all. Only the color change and the classification changes already. Or I mean, it could be the, the text that change. You know, I, I, I can just change instead of a picture of a color square, I say picture of a square. Okay, and you can see that all these are top right. Here, if I change to picture of a square. Yeah, so it might be the text embeddings that, that change the, because if I change back the color square, yeah, so the image embeddings likely is the same. It's the text embeddings here that, that biases the, the, the interpretation. So again, if you want to use clip for this kind of task, uh, be mindful that the text embeddings used in clip are GPT-2, GPT-2, which is uh, not very good. So a slight change of your text can actually affect your retrieval quite drastically. Right? Actually, OpenAI has a better clip model. I believe they used GPT-4 to train it already on the text, but they did not release it. So this model released in 2020, 2021, uh, only uses GPT-2. So just be mindful of that when you use clip for your tasks. Yeah, but I think it works pretty well for, for tasks that, you know, it's just a category like animal, um, logo, food. Yeah, it works pretty well. But if you do longer text, GPT-2 is not good at that. So this is one constraint of using clip. All right, so let's see whether you can like, classify where an apple is instead of a, a square and it, it still cannot do it. So position, no, nope, don't use clip for position. All right, color, All right? So color is basically, I gave it a colored square. The whole image is just a colored square uh, generated like this. And you see red background, green background, blue, black, white, not bad. I realized a trick. If you want to get color, you should use background. So if I change this to a picture of a, something square, right? Picture of a red square. Oh, actually, this works also. Um, red grid. Okay, so looks like it was working. Yesterday, I tested something, uh, and it makes up black and white. But if you use something like black background, white background, yeah, so this, um, this works. So one thing that the authors found out is that if you put like a picture off, it kind of makes this uh, more in line with how the captions are generated in the wow, and it, it works better. So I, if I remove a picture off, you can see like how this works now. So color plus this. You can see if I remove the word a picture off. Hey, sorry, I did not put the color inside. <laughs> oh, it works pretty well also. So yeah, just some prompt engineering stuff. So in order to get this uh working better, you can try putting stuff like a picture off, a photo off. Yeah. So this. I mean, just now I tried red background, green background still works, but the authors say that this kind of thing works better for like image classification. Okay, last experiment I did was text. So in order to do text, what I did was I just generated some text in a, an image and I just see whether it can detect like stuff like OCR, optical character recognition. And I'm quite impressed that it could. So like a picture of buy, a picture of clip, you can see all these matches, a picture of clips, even one letter difference it can detect. 
All right. <clears throat> Although um, the similarity is very close, but we could detect like one and two can also. So this is something the authors also um, said that because the one of the data sets uh, that was used to test uh, is called SST2. Uh, is basically this OCR data set that they generate like synthetic text and then they ask you the, the clip to identify what text it is. It works pretty well for that. But once you use handwritten text, it doesn't work too well. So like MNIST, it only attains an 88% classification accuracy on MNIST. And uh, what I suspect is that, you know, usually if you train an MNIST-only classifier, you know, certain quirks, let me just, like certain quirks, like if this is a six and this is a six, like this is okay because this is very close to um to generated text of six. But if you're six, you write something like that, which is present in MNIST data set. Some people even write six like that. You know, this one might be interpreted as, you know, this might be interpreted as sigma. And if you, you are training on the world's data, you know, this six, this six might be great if, I mean, it matches with syntactic data like that. But if you, if you generate six like that, only like an MNIST only classifier would know that's a six because they don't confuse that for another concept like sigma or like other things. So the thing is, training on the world's data uh, may be great if you if you have an unknown data set you want to go to, the chance of matching is higher. But if you have a very, very specialized data set, then training on the web's data might actually influence the kind of behavior that your model would have for this kind of like edge cases. So I wouldn't fault Clip for that. I think Clip is great in general. It's just that, you know, be careful if you are using it to recognize um, handwritten characters. It may not recognize that well as compared to a specialized handwriting detector model. But you see, it works pretty well. See, great, right? I, I, I was pretty impressed actually when I did this. And if, if you try to do something like, um, to see whether it's a number of a word, you see, I did not even need to give any examples. You see, number, it comes out already. Word, it comes out. And this is purely on this text. So it needs to do some interpretation that, oh, this text is a word and this text is a number. And to me, it's pretty impressive it managed to do that. All right. Then we could do something like that. A text containing the letter E, containing letter I, you see, um, this is not that great. <laughs> and uh, one thing I suspect, it's that the text embedding model may not be able to convey this kind of thing to the picture. So like text, if you want to find out the exact details of a picture, okay, um, I mean, yeah, this one you might be able to classify as clip, but back end in the representation, it does not go to the level of letters. Okay, so you can try also in ChatGPT, you ask uh, ChatGPT, what are the letters in this word? All right, there's a very high chance that it will give a wrong answer. So it's the tokenization of the text embeddings. They are not done at the character level. They are done at the token level, which is a group of characters. So if you want to do like character level stuff, um, doesn't work that well. It, you see, like my numbers one, two, three is okay. So I also did a final experiment, which is okay, not final, but like one of the other experiments, like see whether they can do three letter, four letter, five letter. Again, at the, at the character level, it doesn't work. And it's likely because it's the tokenization issue of, of the embedding space. Okay, I wouldn't say it's an issue, but it's just how it's done. So because it's not given that view of the character view, you ask it character level questions, cannot do. And actually, last... actually yeah. uh, compared to, I think compared to GPT 3.5, GPT 4 is already much better at character level stuff. Hmm. For some reason, I don't know why, but apparently it's better. Maybe it's because uh, there's a better data set. <laughs> they, they maybe did character level data sets. Yeah. yeah. So um, another thing that um, I want to highlight is that if ever there's a better clip model using GPT-4 or GPT-5 as the text embedder and using a better vision model, maybe something that is better than vision transformers, this clip is very powerful. Okay, it's already very powerful now, but it suffers from the constraints of the encoders. Like the text encoder is not, not say the best. GPT-2 here is not, not the best. Vision transformers here miss out quite a lot of things. I think we, we need to improve on this too. Once we improve on that, actually clip embedding very, very powerful. I mean, right now in the reduced form, I call this, this the reduced form because this is technology three years ago. This is already quite good and people are still using this. 
So the idea of clip itself is a very powerful one. Later we can go through like why it works. I, I'm actually very excited about clip because it not only works, it can like zero shot to your environment quite easily. Okay, provided your environment is a generic one. Okay. So um here we can also see like how we do this for greetings and for objects. And you see, it even knows the meaning of the word, like hello is a greeting, bye is a greeting, and object clip and clips are objects. So I think this is the strength of like LLMs that they know the semantic meaning of your tokens quite well, even if your tokens are not the like you don't even need to give the, the context because of web data, it already knows like this image belongs to what kind of uh, context, this text belongs to what kind of context. Yeah. Also, one last thing, I, I didn't do this, but you know, just to just to see whether it works. Let, let's try to do an addition thing. So let me just draw something. Okay, so live. Okay, I'll show you how, how to use this. Okay, I basically created this with the help of GPT. Okay, so let's just do some numbers. Okay, so one plus one, one plus two, two plus two, two plus three, something like that. Okay. So let's uh let's just do the last experiment here. And then our text here is uh we can do sum of two, sum of three, sum of four, sum of five. Okay, so you can see over here, um, this is sum of three, sum of two, sum of, so it's close to random. So another thing is um LM suck at numbers, all right? They suck at calculation. Okay, so even if you give this to ChatGPT, okay, ChatGPT will still work. But you know, if you do in the embedding space like that, the embedding space is not a mathematical embedding space. It is more of a semantic, uh, kind of matching space like this. Uh, greetings and objects. Uh, don't use this for numbers. All right, uh, addition, subtraction, or this kind of mathematical operations. You are better off using a calculator. Okay. But all in all, you can see that based on these experiments here, it's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't, this is not even in their training set, I think. Yeah, you can just come out with your own words. And I think it can still do the classification pretty well because it probably already knows how to classify the characters. Right. Actually, actually that, that may not be true. Right? Because in GPT, if you put like hello like that, it will reply you hello. So, you know, maybe this only works for um, common words. Okay, I, I didn't really try the, the non-common words. So yeah, before I move back to the presentation proper, y'all have anything you want to like find out more or you want me to try out something else for any of this? Okay, I think overall it's, it's pretty cool. Like I, I was very impressed with this. Like this one, you know, I just take some random photos that I have, I just search online some stuff. This one is from that paper, uh, the Wakamo, but the rest are all like all my own stuff. Like not, not say my stuff, but I, I just did image search and just did something. It works and that was impressive in my opinion. Okay, so let me go back to the PowerPoint. So that was a demo of clip embeddings. So I think it is very easy to use. I just use the transformers library, put in your image uh, file names, put in your text description, and you're good to go. All right, so this is what we went through. Category of images works well. Color works pretty well also. Text detection works pretty well. Position, not, not good at all. Don't ever use it for position. And also don't use it for calculation of numbers, all right? So what are the key takeaways that I have after playing around with this clip and reading the clip paper is that like large scale web learning okay, is better than the data set specific training for most cases. Okay, unless you know, a data set has certain quirks that you know, like the six in the MNIST is sideways, you know, that, um, that doesn't really benefit from web skill training because web skill training will teach it that is meaning something else like Sigma, all right? So um, this there needs to be a caveat for that. But in general, if you are using this for an application, Clip is very good because Clip matches like natural um, distributions of stuff on the web. So this one gets a caveat here. I mean, if if data set is very specific, then Clip may be worse. Okay, I have a slide on that later. Later we can cover this. One other takeaway is that, you know, in general, OpenAI has shown us that web skill learning has achieved great success. Like a lot of times in machine learning in the past 10 to 20 years, people have been doing specialized data sets, uh, supervised learning on those data sets to learn the labels matching with the inputs. And those have such great success on that data set itself. 
but it doesn't generalize quite well outside of it. Surprisingly, just using web scale data without much supervision works just as well as this supervised loading or even better. So it has shown us like in, Ch in chat GPT, we do next token prediction, something like I am a, then you blank over here. So you could put like student, pet, you know. So basically based on the distribution of what, what is next, you can really learn the semantic meaning of what does it mean to be a student, what's the meaning of I and so on. So that doesn't need any human labels at all because you can just blank off the next word and ask the LM to predict what's the next word or next token. Okay. For image, can we do that? All right, so you think about it. Can we blank off? <laughs> can we blank off the next image and predict it? Okay, hard. Okay, it cannot because the image domain is high modality. And in this case, also another thing. Next token prediction is different from sentence level or overall image prediction. Okay, in chat GPT, what we are interested in, our prediction objective is the next token. But here in Flip, our prediction objective is not the next token. Our prediction objective is how to match the entire text to the entire image. So it's something like, you know, if you do text embeddings to find out similarity of two sentences, that objective is different from the next token prediction objective. So this is hard to scale because there's so many possible sentences, so many possible images. But now, like using this contrastive method in Clip, it manages to like at least learn in a pretty effective way to match between the two very difficult broad domains to match. So Wait, what? It, yeah, I sorry. Have, I have one question here. Um, you said it's hard to do next, like kind of the analog of uh, next token prediction for image, right? Yeah. But from what I read, uh, apparently that's what Sora does. Yeah, we'll cover Sora another time. So Sora that does it in uh, um, basically they managed to do it in latent space. So that is that is great. Like in abstraction space, we we cannot predict the image in the pixel space, but at least in the abstraction space is possible. Okay. So uh, thanks for making that point. Yeah. So I I think Sora is. The next thing I want to cover, I, I think there's a lot of good ideas in Sora that can do this as well. Right. But going back to the thing is like, if you want to do like next token prediction for images, it's difficult because you can't map it back easily to the pixel space. Okay. But the thing is right now, the main thing we are trying to do here for image to text matching is not, uh, so I also want to emphasize, the thing we are doing here for image to text matching is not the next token prediction or next image prediction. We are just purely concerned with how to map the whole sentence level to the overall image, which is a difficult problem. So what OpenAI did was they take caption image pairs from all over the web, and they just use that as the learning signal between how to match your image and how to match your text. And I mean, that requires a bit of human labels because like, Obviously, the, the image online needs to have a caption. But thankfully, there's a lot of images that can do this. So uh, what Terry you said about um, predicting the next image, if we can do this, and you know, if we can do this, so this is something that I was thinking of. So like, can we pre-seed the text and image encoders with good representations from next token prediction. All right. Then do contrastive learning. Okay, so this is something that I think is possible because in the text embedding models by OpenAI, like um, text ATA002 or um, text embedding small, text embedding large, um, they actually preceded the text encoder with the what the GPT has already learned. Then they do contrastive learning after that. So this actually helps to get the encoders in a better space. And I think this would be an immense upgrade to Clip if they do something like that. So do what they did for Sora for image prediction to precede what the encoder should be, precede the text encoder, and then we try to match them using contrastive learning. I think that will make it very, very powerful. 
Okay, so a bit of details here, but I just want to emphasize that the matching of image to text domain is a very difficult problem. All right, so this is one thing that um, OpenAI did uh, at first. Okay, they, they wanted to see like how fast is the learning okay, compared to traditional approaches. So over here, this is the image. So like given an image, predict a caption. So this is a caption prediction problem. And traditionally, the first thing that they did was to feed the image like in tokens to the LM and ask the LM to generate the caption. And you can see that um, getting the LM to generate the caption based on the image tokens is actually one of the worst things to do because there's so many tokens, too many tokens to predict. It's very, very hard to predict the accurate caption. And you know, if you are just penalizing the model or encouraging the model to predict exactly the way the caption is uh, generated in the in the online text, you know, I could say an image of a boy or a picture of a boy or a boy in the picture. You know, all this, if you just use next token prediction objective, you'll get very different loss function. Or you get, you get very different losses, although all mean the same thing. So using a transformer to predict the caption because it's so diverse and so many possibilities, it's not that great because um, it's not like next token prediction. Like if you are just trying to match the exact caption itself, it's hard because the image has many ways to describe. All right, you know, they always say that image speaks a thousand words. You can also say an image can be described in a thousand ways or actually more than that. It's very hard to use a transformer to predict the caption. So one thing is that you know, they use back of words. So basically, back of words is like um you based on the text itself, like this is a text. Then you basically um do some they actually use continuous back of words, which uh basically converts this all the individual tokens to a common embedding space, to an average embedding space. So this is a text will become something like will become something like a vector. And you know, just predicting this vector itself, you no, know, because it kind of like captures the overall meaning of that sentence, it actually learns much faster. It learns much faster if we aggregate the meaning of all these tokens into one like common meaning pool. And you know, that is something that uh they figured out for like image to text. You know, you try to predict the text exactly, it's not gonna be a uh, it's not going to work well. Okay, what works well is you predict the gist of what it means. And this, the, the very fact that back of words can really help to improve over transformers goes to show that, you know, maybe predicting the exact words is not a good objective. Maybe you want to predict the overall meaning. And true enough, once they used contrastive loss to improve the prediction, it improves it way better than if you use a transformer. So one thing is that the main takeaway from this is that you need to predict in abstraction space. You cannot predict in the text space for caption prediction. You have to predict in a space where it's a bit more abstract because there's just so many ways you can represent an image. You, you can't exactly go it out back to tokens. You have to do the matching. So I'll put here the learning for high dimensional spaces has to be done in an abstraction space or latent space. So what this experiment showed is that latent space is good. All right. in, a, in, a, in a short and sweet sentence, what they showed here is prediction in latent space or abstraction space is better than predicting in token space. And that is the key insight of CLIP, where we are trying to map the latent space or the abstraction space of the image to the abstraction space of the text. And we're trying to increase the match in that abstraction space. Note again, we are not going back to the image space and we are also not going back to the text space. Clip is a one-shot process from the inputs to the embedding space. There's no reverse process from embedding back to text. Okay, although you could um, create like LMs to, to embed back into text, but the thing is the output will be in an abstraction space. And the prediction in an abstraction space is very useful because you learn much faster. You can see that over here, based on the number of images processed, like if you do like 5 million or something, you already see that like using the abstraction space, you learn much faster compared to predicting back in the token space.
Uh, questions for this? Any? Okay. So what is their data set for clip? <laughs> 400 million text image pairs. So unless you are open AI, you probably won't have access to the whole web worth of data like that. Yeah, in fact, 400 million is the, um, basically they already sanitized the data. So initially they probably have billions or trillions of text image pairs, but they took away those that um, that don't really match well. So how did they how did they curate their data set? Okay. I'm emphasizing a lot of how they did the data set here because if you want to use the clip model for yourself, you better make sure that the images you give and the text you give matches how they created the data set. Okay. Because in distribution, if you can make your image text pairs in distribution, it will perform much better than out of distribution. Yeah, that works well. That that works for any machine learning model. In in distribution prediction is always better than outside of the out, out of distribution prediction. So how did they create the data set? So let's take a look. The text must contain one of five hundred thousand query words. Uh, what words are this? This must occur at least hundred times in the English version of Wikipedia. Anyone can tell me what this means? Can you use it for other languages? Uh, anyway, uh, anyone? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just... Well, it depends on the training and the embedding behaviors. Sure. I mean, as a technique, it's certainly usable. As a, if a specific test group. Yeah. Oh, so they're query words at least 100 times in, in uh, English Wikipedia. Probably yeah, not. So yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, Richard, what you say is correct. If you train your own clip embeddings on other languages, yes, you can. But if you are using the clip that OpenAI has created, it's best not to use it for other languages because the training set is all English. <laughs> so it's better if you like do a translation to English than do it on clip. And over here, you can see that this means that cross language support. This is my opinion. Cross language support probably not good. Rare domain specific words, those words that appear less than 100 times in the English version of Wikipedia in 2020, probably it wouldn't know all these words. Like, if let's say a new word has been invented right now, that word probably has no meaning in the image space or the text space because they did not do the training there. All right, so just take note if you are using the clip model, um, the word should appear in 2020 <laughs> in the English version of Wikipedia. If not, it's, it's going to be hard for. Um, click to do, to know what this is. All right. So they class balance results by including up to 20,000 image text pairs per query. Okay. So class balance is important because if you don't do this class balancing, if we don't do this, the model might bias to only predicting well or dominant class. So this is a perennial like machine learning problem. It's like if you have class imbalance, the minority class prediction will suffer. So OpenAI, um, they kind of mitigated that by improving or increasing artificially the number of image text pairs so that the loss function will cater to each query word equally. All right, so I, I, I think this until now is still, still quite good. All right, and the thing is, although the training objective is not OCR, the training objective is not action recognition, classification, geolocation, just giving the image text pass of the web, it could do those tasks already later on in their evaluation sets. So let me emphasize that again. Just giving web scale data of image and text pass, they're able to do all this um, specific requirements like OCR without any specialized training. You just take image text pass, try to match the semantic similarity, somehow, you are able to do OCR after that. Uh, and, and that may be because there could be in the wow quite a lot of OCR text image pass, right? So it could be in distribution. But the very fact is because of all this wide variety of data that has been used for training, it unlocks quite a lot of capabilities that a very narrow and small data set probably cannot. Mm -hmm. Because a small and narrow data set only unlocks like one or two capabilities. You train over the web, you unlock a lot of different capabilities. And as shown in the experiments I did earlier, it is quite versatile. You give it an image, you ask for background, okay. Give an image, ask for object, okay. Give an image, ask for action. It's okay also. Yeah, they manage to know it's a fight, it's a sword, you know. Many different versions of the same picture can do. 
if you give that picture to ImageNet, you ask it, what's, is, is it a fight? It probably cannot do because there's no category for fight. Okay, it's all objects. So it can probably classify, oh, there's a, there's a sword, there's a human. Okay, but you cannot say, oh, it's a black background, white background. Because that's not a label in ImageNet. So one other thing is that this skills beyond labels in any classification data set. Okay, because if you were to do a classification data set, you only have X labels. Beyond that, you have no idea what, what that word means. And most of the time in classification data set, the label is not given to the model to use, okay? Like the label text. So in classification data set, it's like normally it's class zero, class one, class two. We don't even have this information at all. So this is actually a huge downfall because this means like if you train a model on ImageNet, if your object you want to predict is not one of the thousand images there or thousand classes there, ImageNet probably cannot do it. But if you use Clip because of the way you open and train your text and image pairs, even if it's not one of these classes here, it might still be able to predict it because in the web of 400 million image text pairs, as long as that word has appeared before in one of them or a few of them, especially if it's one of the 500,000 query words, it should be good to go. So Clip is really very, very versatile and quite robust to many different versions of the prompts. Okay. So I actually quite like this model a lot. <clears throat> uh, any questions before we move on? Okay. So what are the uh, architectures that they use? Uh, they basically use a pack of words encoder. Um, don't, don't use this, okay? This, this is not good. GPT-2, all right? <laughs> use GPT-2, all right? GPT-2 at text encoders. ResNet didn't work too well. They use VITs instead. Vision transformers. So for this purposes, the vision transformer actually encodes a better representation of the text compared to like fixed filters in a in a ResNet. So going by image patches has image patches uh, helps to generalize better. Yep. So I like it requires more data though. But, so vision transformers and uh, GPT. Embedding dimension for the hidden layer is 5.12. So again, no, this uh, may not be that expressive. So in the future versions of Clip, likely is likely higher dimensions. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't think OpenAI is going to release any more versions of Clip. Okay. They are probably using the more updated one for their doll ease. Yeah. But I don't think they're going to release it anymore. All right. So Next, we have the max sequence length kept at 76 tokens. And this is very important, which means that your text prompt, there's a rule of thumb 76 tokens, maybe it's about 20 words. So, you know, your text tokens, or actually 76 divided by four is about 15. Okay, let's say it's just 20. Text, uh, as a rule of thumb, text description should be lesser than 20 words. Okay because of this uh, truncation limit. So just take note when you do the clip text embeddings. All right, so um, how long did it take to train clip? Okay, so basically I'm just quoting you some numbers from the paper, which I don't think average folk like us can, can do. So like the ResNet model, it took about 18 days. The vision transformer model took about 12 days. Yeah, and this is all on like huge amounts of GPUs. Okay, so let's move on to how it works. So this is the classical image that is shown for clip embeddings. So how this clip embeddings works is that they actually encode n text samples over here. So like each sample corresponding to the image. And we have n image samples over here. And then what we do is we do an encoder. So like this encoder, text encoder is GPT-2. And this one is vision transformers. And we go through the embedding, we get the text embeddings and we get the image embeddings. All these are 512 dimensions. And then we do a cosine similarity of it. So these are the cosine similarity given by a dot product. Okay, so um, by right, the cosine similarity also will need to do like this. I dot T uh, divided by magnitude of I divided by magnitude of T. Okay. But over here, they did not do the magnitude. 
likely because these uh, embeddings here are already normalized. So you can treat these embeddings as magnitude one. So you have to do a, a step of normalization here if you don't want to do. So all this, um, all this here are already normalized to magnitude one, all right? Which means that this this term and this term will be one in the cosine similarity, and then the cosine similarity term will be cosine similarity term would just be i dot t, which is the image embeddings dot the text embeddings. Okay. So, I mean, just to illustrate how, how this dot product is done, it's like that. If your image embeddings is like that, suppose your image embeddings is like this, one, one, zero, and then your text embeddings is like this. Let's, let's suppose I give you a, like, so the dot product will be one times two plus one times zero plus zero times minus one. So your dot product will be two. So dot product is actually very easy to calculate. You just need to take corresponding numbers, you just multiply them, and then you just add all of them together. So calculating this matrix is actually very fast. Like it's just a linear time operation. You can just do one short matrix multiplication, you can get it done. So in a commercial system, you are using this, you can go through like your entire image and text embeddings already pre-calculated. And then when you want to compare, you just need to do a dot product for like, if you take an image, you want to find out the text description, you can just do dot product for every single, even this image I want, you do a dot product for every single text description. You can get a top K here. So it's very, very fast to do this. It's the, it's the same as rag actually, yeah. For inference. Okay, but how do we do the training between the image and the text embeddings? The training is very simple also. What we want to do is we want to maximize i dot t, which is this blue squares here. We want to maximize everything in this blue squares because these are the ground truth, like this, this image and this text matches. So you want to maximize everything here. And then you want to minimize the rest. And that's basically the uh, objective. So later you can see in their code, they did the maximization and minimization in a slightly um, different way. They didn't do by the whole matrix like that. What they do is like this. Given this row here, I maximize this one and I minimize this one. Yeah, then I do the same for all rows. So this is the row level objective. And for the columns, like let's say I take this as a column, I maximize this one and I minimize this one. So uh, in the code itself, or in practice, we maximize the term in blue per row and per column. And this simple training objective has led to quite good performance for clip embeddings. So you can see that um, there are some issues with this training, of course. Uh, one issue is that, you know, if you want to do this, your images here cannot be too similar. Uh, let me just write this down. Images cannot be too similar. Because if not, you will, you will kind of match wrongly, right? Because you only maximize this blue box. If you have image n here that is the same as image one and you minimize this, you know, that is a conflicting signal to, to maximize. Another thing is your text cannot be too similar. So when they did over the web data, they split into batches of like, I think 30 over 1,000 uh, rows and columns and they do this. So there's a chance that there are some images that are similar or some text that are similar, but you know, because of this objective, it kind of not trains for that. Like, for example, this is a puppy, right? If your text here is puppy, and then another text here is dog. You know, we, we don't want to do that because like, um, this is actually the same as pup. And then like in this objective, because we maximize this, we minimize this, we kind of minimize dog when it's supposed to be the same. So uh, in OpenAI's defense, as you train this over multiple batches, the chance of this happening is much lower compared to the rest being dissimilar. So like maybe the rest here, like car, plane, and so on. So the, the objective that you maximize here would over the long run, you know, it spreads out, although there might be similar things here, over the long run of training, it generally knows that this like puppy matches to pup. So again, this is a contractive training. And I think this level of training scales very well to large data because you don't have to curate your positive pass and negative pass as long as 
you know, like the 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 stuff is like diverse enough. In general, it would um, uh, in in general, the chance of a uh, similar thing happening here is quite low, compared to dissimilar things. If your data set is diverse enough, so it scales well without much human uh, intervention. Right. So how do we predict? So we can use clip for prediction by doing this. So assuming you have a list of n classes here, you just embed it like a photo of something. Okay, so they found that a photo of something works better than just using that object itself. Because in natural image text um, captions, the text usually is not a single word for the caption. The text is usually a phrase, like a, a picture of a dog. So if you match that natural distribution, it works better. So you encode all of this, like a plain car dog. So you encode all of this into this um, embedding space. And let's say you have a certain image you want to do. You encode it, and then you do dot product here, and then you do top K, top K extraction. Yeah, so this is the same as a rack process. It, essentially, what they describe here is a rack process, retrieval augmented generation process, given a query. All right, you find out what your most relevant embeddings are, and then you output them. So over here, you do top one, you output only photo of a dog. And you can see over here, this is pretty generic because you can embed anything you want here. You can embed anything you want here. So you can retrieve text from images or you can retrieve images from text. You can do either one. Okay, as long as you already have the ground truth stuff you have in the input space. So you see prediction is done in the latent abstraction space. So one thing is that um, you can't convert back from the embeddings to image or text. At least with clip you can, but you know, maybe with other models you can. So your inputs have to be the answer already. Yeah, so if you want to do like a match from your image to the text, your text must already contain the ground truth answer for the image. If not, you can't generate back from this embedding back to the ground truth. All right. So another thing that I wanted to ask is like, this is one abstraction space here. Could we learn multiple abstraction spaces so that we can do multiple tasks? Like maybe this one might be better for object detection. Another one might be better for background detection and so on. So this is something that uh, I leave it as a question. There will be a slide later to talk about it. Uh, any questions so far for this too? These are actually the main things, how click works. All, all good? Okay. So this is the details for the code. And over here, you can see that what they do is, um, that's why I, I showed you all in the code just now, we have an image encoder, we have a text encoder. Uh, they normalize the, the, the magnitude for the image embeddings and the text embeddings. So what are image embeddings and what are the text embeddings? Essentially, it is the, like, if you look over here, what they do is they just take the text encoder and they dot product with the weights here. Okay, and you can see what are these weights also. So this basically is a way to get the, <coughs> the okay, this, this, this weights, it's essentially the model, I think. Yeah, so the, the main thing you want to get here is you want to get this uh, final embedding here, TE and IE. Okay, so this, these weights are actually not the, uh, this, this is not the dot product for the comparison between text and image. This this basically just saying that we could do a, like a projection of your image to your embedding space. This is running the model itself actually. So this, this weights here, this WI, this is your image encoder or, or your image model that you pass through. And then this is WT here, is your text model. Oh, wait, let me think about it. Actually, it looks more like a linear embedding layer, right? <laughs> so let me go and find out more about how, how, how this is done, because this is not the uh, dot product that is that is done in the uh the comparison. Okay, the comparison dot product is done here. All right, so we take the image and the text embeddings and we do a dot product. Okay, and just take note that they also have this thing 
which is basically like this e to the power of t. So they basically convert the, the numbers into logits. So this, this dot product here, let's say we have the dot product matrix, we call it D like that. So this is actually done as a, there's an exponential term here, which basically converts this to like logits. And then when you do cross entropy loss, okay, it's actually a mathematical thing. So this basically allows you to do cross entropy loss after you do this. And cross entropy loss, the main thing is that you want to um you want to make the logits corresponding to your um your ground truth higher and those that are not corresponding to ground truth lower. So it is is basically what you see over here. You want to make all these things here higher and you want to make all these things here lower. And at least that's what I think this is done in the code. Okay. So disclaimer, I haven't had time to look fully at the code yet, but at least based on this in the paper itself, it looks like they are doing the losses at the row level and the column level. Okay, so now let's talk about how clip is done. So they have compared over, okay, they say 30 data sets on the website, but actually in the paper it's only 27 data sets. So it's group performance across quite a lot of data sets. And you can see that this is like, you see the guacamole, this is done here. And all the rest of the food here is ranked quite lowly based on the cosine similarity converted to logits. Okay, so here you can see that like television studio is quite well also. So all these kind of things that have very clear cut um, classification, all these are okay. Um, this one is something that they didn't do too well. Okay, like this is a like satellite image. The answer is actually annual cropland. And the one that they suggested is permanent cropland. But if you take a look at over here, the, the satellite image is like kind of blurry. Satellite image is hard, quite blurry. And you know, this is basically the, uh, like the labels are quite close. So if you want to do the clip for very, very specialized data sets, where distinguishing between two features like is an expert task, like um, identify, wearing this, uh, identify whether there's a tumor or not, clip is not good for that. Okay, because in the web scale data, it's very unlikely that this are uh, emphasized in many different image text paths. What is likely emphasized, you can see is like stuff like food, you know, people talk about food, you know, people talk about places, people talk about like transportation, but you don't really see people talk about satellite images, right? Because we just don't have the capabilities to upload this kind of images unless you are satellite, right? So again, you can see this is a distribution kind of drift. Like what you can see online is what it does well. Oh uh, yeah, Richard, you raise your hand. Yeah, just a quick thing. I mean, in effect, this is a kind of classifier. And to me, right? so I think that's a fair description, but the labels that are being used pretty messy, right? So like you're saying, it helps to say, is this a picture of a dog instead of, is it a dog or, or something like that? It, so you, the, for me, this reads a lot as a sort of a, a data prep problem. They've, they've put in a pretty messy data and they get out pretty messy results. Mm -hmm. And, and I, maybe also the issue is say the, the, the cropland, as you're saying there, is and I am not an expert in crop in photo uh, satellite photos of cropland, but maybe actually there's it's twenty percent permanent and eighty percent annual cropland. So, I, I, but I don't know what I'm looking at. So, the and there is roads in there. So there's highways and all roads are present. I can see them. Um, so I think there's a that might be the the challenge here is it's trying to is at least for the the, the satellite that I don't think that the input data was very good necessarily because it's saying a centered satellite photo of this or that, but is it? I don't know. Um, and more than one of those things can be present in the same photo. Yeah. So it might be a data set issue also. Like when people created this data set, um, they might be like, looking at a very, very specific feature here to find out that this is a cropland or so on. So 
like you might be looking only at this part here in order to identify and this data set might already be very hard and like maybe only experts can do it so this one i think even for the expert models they also make errors so indeed uh, especially this one i also think there's also quite a lot of positional based information needed so positions are not great for the image embedders uh, like vision transformers they don't preserve uh, positions that well so this kind of very specialized data sets that meet this kind of specialized tasks it's just not good at doing that. Yeah, so I agree with what you said. So, yep, let's uh, move on. So now if you want to use this um, clip for classification, what we need to do is we need to prepare our text captions. So we need to provide more context for the class, okay? Like for example, one issue they face is like in ImageNet, the word crane was used both for construction cranes and cranes that fly. So if you want to use this for classification, you need to specify your location. You need to specify like the context better. So it would be great if you could use like, you know, construction crane and an animal, a crane animal, you know? So you give it some context words so that the text encoder can encode better the context, All right? So um, just one point here. The other thing is that single word class is not common. So by putting a photo of the label, they say that it increased by increased accuracy by like one to two percent. Uh, not not that great, but you know at least it shows that if you match the distribution of the text in the wow, you get better performance. So when you use clip, we also try to match the distribution that the text image captions appear on online. All right. So. So how did they use text captioning for classification? Actually, it's a uh, is this. Is basically this one here. They take all the thousand classes of ImageNet or whatever classes of that data set, encode it, and then they take the image and they find the best class. And this works pretty well. Yeah, it, it works pretty well for, even in ImageNet, it actually achieves quite a competitive score. So one other thing that they've realized is that <clears throat> using some prompt engineering of the text prompt, you can actually improve the classification better. So if you don't put any like class names, okay. Oh, uh, sorry, not 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 don't put don't put any context to your class names. Like that's not earlier the crane. You just put like construction crane or cranes. Yeah. If you don't don't put that, um, it, it performs worse. Like this is the baseline performance. If you do the um, sorry, I think this contextless class name is not clip. Okay, this one is likely is just like the ImageNet classification model. Yeah. So if you if you were to use the um some prompt engineering technique on Zomblink, you can actually boost the model gain. All right. So how did they do this prompt engineering? So this is how the prompt engineering is done. So they actually did this. They specified the type of data set. And over here, it's like this. In, in Oxford pets, they say that this is a type of pet. In food, they say this is a type of food. Okay. Aircraft, they say this is a type of aircraft. So you can see it's quite 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 simple. You just take the data set type and then you put over here. And surprisingly, this actually improves like one to two percent of the uh, OCR. You just put a quotation around text and number, right? And the satellite, you put a satellite photo. So these are the kind of things that can help improve the label accuracy by specifying the context in the prompt. But just take note, uh, make sure your prompts don't go beyond. 76 tokens, okay, because that's the truncation limit. So it's pretty cool, just a simple thing like that um, could affect the results already. And um, another thing that they did is to ensemble the embeddings. So like, for example, in uh, in ImageNet, like you could have photo of a big dog, photo of a small dog, because like the class dog might contain many different things. So if you ensemble over like different context prompts, they did not give all the context prompts, but like let's say you can put a picture of a label, an image containing label. So you can have like many different kinds of prompts like this, and you ensemble the average embedding across all these text prompts. Um, it leads to like three to four percent accuracy improvement on ImageNet. So total with this plus the prompt engineering, you get about five percent accuracy increase. One thing this means is that because they train it like uh, or or rather because this kind of um, highlights the fact that you know uh, if you 
if you don't <coughs> do this consoling method, it doesn't do that well, right? It kind of highlights that if you want to use clip for specific image uh, features, you probably can't get that, okay? Because you it only does well if you ensemble over all these things in, in a class. Like if I were to ask directly for a photo of a big something, probably cannot do it that well. Or it could be that image net, the class itself contains all these diverse things. That's why you need to ensemble. So yeah, just a curious thing that, you know, ensembling this thing helps because I would have thought that, you know, if you ensemble, you kind of like lose the meaning of that individual thing like that. Yeah, it's just, it's just weird that this ensembling helps. Yeah. Okay, I mean, this this might be a quote of ImageNet that contains many different data sets. But this also highlights to me that, you know, if you use clip, you probably don't want to give specific image features inside the clip embeddings because it doesn't work that well. Uh, if not, just a, just, just a problem like this will work already. Yeah. Or it could be ImageNet, yeah. I, I, I don't know. This one, I don't know. Yeah. This one, I have to admit that um, it just, it's just weird that Ensembling could give such a big performance gain. <laughs> yeah. All right. So what are the data sets that Clip does well and what are the data sets that Clip doesn't? So Clip does well actually quite well for this kind of natural image data sets like Saifa came from natural images, cars, country, food. Uh, food surprisingly does very well. I think a lot of people post images about food online. All right. So you can see that all these data sets, uh, they did not train on any of them okay so they did not train on all the data sets sst is the ocr data set yeah, they did not train on any of these data sets they train only on the image text captions in the wall uh, yet they perform better than uh, restnet 50 specialized on these data sets okay so what this shows is that the zero shot clip if the images are present in the wall close to the distribution of your data set it does quite well. Okay. And it can augment a very limited data set. And because it has the class labels in text, it can actually help with transfer learning from other images learned in the wild. But what is bad at is that if the task is very specialized, the images are not commonly present. Right? What are the kind of images? Satellite images. Not good. Limb node tumor detection. Okay. Or you are doing certain tasks that require some cognition abilities that are not just simple classified image kind of thing. Counting number of objects, recognizing distance to nearest car. So this, this are kind of data sets that, you know, maybe just using image classifiers are not enough. You need to imbue them with some other logic, like for counting objects, you need an object detector and then you count the number of bounding boxes maybe. Yeah, so these are the kind of things that I think I wouldn't fault Clip for because Clip wasn't built to do this but you can see that like for the counting one and like for the distance, it does quite poorly compared to a specialized uh, model that does that. So do tasks that are more related to like classification. If you want to use clip, yeah, it works best for those. And um, if your data set is like too specific, like the images are very, very similar to each other, only like one small difference for, uh, for classification prediction like tumor, you know, you just need to identify this very, very small lump there. It's very hard for Clip to do it because it's, it's not trained on any of this specific data. Uh, but what people have done is they have taken Clip and they fine tune on this and it works quite well. So fine tuning Clip is an option. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes. Does fine tuning Clip work better than a specific, like the other approach where you just train on specific data? Which one was that? Uh, I think fine tuning clip will work better only if the features are similar to online features like of the 400 million text image pass. Because clip has already learned some form of features by um by doing the contrastive learning. So if your image is very different from online images, it might be better to train from scratch. Yeah. So uh, but but okay, so in the Specific if you want to train a uh, from scratch uh, just for the specific task, right? But you can't do something that clip is able to do, like you don't have this uh joint embedding of image and text, right? This has to be acquired by massive train like training on massive data. 
Mm, if let's say your data set itself is not enough to learn the features, then using click and fine tuning will be will be better. Like if your data set is very small. Uh no, I'm talking about like use more like use cases because for specific one, just now I think you mentioned like for example a classifier, the best it can do is just to output the label, but it cannot do, cannot it, it's not as flexible as clear where you know, uh, the description is in natural language and it can be more versatile. In some sense. Description of clip is in natural. Yeah, yeah. Description of clip is in natural language. So your point is that uh, that engineering is good or bad? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm just saying clip comes with some added features, which if you need it, you can't just use train a specific classifier. So. And on top of that, also you mentioned if like there's at least some some similarities between the 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 image online that I, I think there has to be at least some similarity in terms of the feature, right? Then it will help. Like it, my gut feeling is it, it has to be better than just yeah, training out specifically. <laughs> mm -hmm. True. If your task is not position related, yes. Uh, because you know, if you do vision transformers, you lose the position information already. Yeah. So that one you might need a specialized model to extract the position and so on. If your task is just like generic image recognition kind, surely the online images will have some similarity. Yes, that, that you are right. But okay, let me just draw a diagram to illustrate this. So if this is the whole pool of distributions online, okay. And these are the different like classifications you can do, like triangle, x square, circle. These are the different types like bird, plane, all this, right? Okay, so imagine what kinds of features will you learn if you are training on this web scale data versus let's say this star over here, okay? And I I, I zoom out this star. So actually in my data set, it's just this star alone. But this star contains like mini star one, mini star two, mini star three, mini star four, five, six, seven, of five and six. And in this star itself, you can see that, like, if you were to do a feature classifier for this entire web data, so this is web data, and this is your specific data. Like, star only appears one time in the whole thing. So the amount of, uh, amount of resources to, mem to like understand the star is, is low. Okay, because you need to cater for diverse kind of data. But if you're you are, you are, you are generally interested to distinguish between one, two, three, four, five, six, you need to spend more resources to distinguish regions in the star. So you can see that um clip being a very generic model, and you know, um the like if you are using ResNet or Vision Transformers, there's only so much capacity to learn stuff. So if you are just narrowly interested in what this star contains, then the clip embedding model already learns all these other features. You need to kind of discard it. Like, you know, for MNIST, you're just interested whether it's a straight line or curve, you know, that kind of stuff. You learn stuff like six. And then six can be written like that sometimes. This one corresponds to other stuff like sigma. You need to unlearn those. And this actually takes up space in your in your model. But that's what fine tuning does, right? True, true. So provided you already have a feature there, you can actually like amplify this feature. It's just, you know, when you learn neural network weights, it's kind of hard to eat up the other kind of weights in the model if they're already quite strong in the activation. Not really, because you can just keep training on your specific data and the catastrophic catastrophic forgetting will occur. But I, I would say uh, I will agree with you in that uh, if you pass it just to do MNIST classification, then I mean, I wouldn't say it's worse in terms of performance, but it definitely is an overkill. True, true. No, but actually on the point of retraining, right? People have found that once the network has already trained to do a certain task, you take that train model and you try to learn a new task, it actually can perform worse off than if you take a blank new model with random weights and, and learn it. Really? Yeah, because can if you, you share the can you share the paper with me? Because what my understanding is the opposite. 
because if you train, you 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 find. Well, your... I mean, the paper that I can share is my own research. I mean, I I, I did alpha zero. Uh, so alpha zero, if it learns a bad move, it's very hard to unlearn that move. Um, I think because that's involved the sequential decision making, right? It's a bit different from. Anyway, we can discuss often. Um, another thing is so. My intuition is like it's more than just this tiny feature you learn uh during pre training on the web data. Another thing is, um, I think it has been shown, even you train on like cross modality, it helps, right? You train model on some modality, then later on you, you train it on some other modality. Like, uh, sorry, I think it's joint training. But my point is, if you train just with more data, even if it's other modality is still even it's different modality it still can help. Right. So but here we are just we are using the same modality. So we if I extrapolate a bit, then I think it can help. But yeah, that's just that's my I mean once you already have pre-built features that are not useful to your data data set at all, and you need to unlearn them. You know the amount of training you need to do is much higher than if you take just a blank slate to to train it. Not not only yeah, if, you, you only if, only if your initial runaway is closer to yes correct. Why if I say that all the features are all counter to what you need to detect? So let's say you need to detect pixel level, but all my features are object level. They need to uh, unlearn all that, the that features. doesn't necessarily yeah. translate to opposite direction, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, this one, the uh, best way to do is <laughs> take a train model and you see whether, like you take a train model on sci-fi, you try to see whether you can learn image net. Uh, that one I think can, because it's same, but you take a train model on something and you try to learn something else versus taking a blank model from scratch. I can try to find whether I can see some research papers that do that. Okay, sure. Yeah, my intuition is that if your model that you are trained on is training on something very different from what you want to eventually learn, it will be worse off. I agree if it's like, totally going the opposite direction in the parameter space of course yeah but but i thought that's the case for so you're saying web scale data should already contain what you want right yeah and then you can just like spend more effort to since you already has a star here you spend more effort to focus on that star from the initial features that's and, and i also think the the effort you learn the rest are not totally wasted because there's definitely some transferable Transfer um, learning there, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. let's say if you have a label, say that this is a red color thing, green color, blue color. So somewhere out here will have red and blue and green that you can learn and you can match faster compared to if you learn from scratch without knowing what's red, green, blue. Yeah, and, and that's that's also some intuition I think applies to human learning as well. Mm. That you know what's the difficulty? The difficulty is that if your classes are containing stuff like you know, let's say for example, position a left ball, a ball on the left, ball on the right. And you no, know, we, we just don't have this thing very well here. You may not be able to learn this. Like if let's say the meaning of the word is really learned wrongly. Yeah. So this one, this one really depends on like how, how Clip learns the meanings of the words and how your classes are, are structured. So let's say if you Clip has learned that, you know, a star is a star. And then now you call it a circle. No, if, if you want to unlearn the meaning of a star over 400 million okay, data. I, 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 I see what you were saying, trying to say. If click learns, let's say there is a word that has multiple meanings, but in your context, in your use case, it has a very exotic meaning that doesn't even appear on the, the internet, then then the click will by default think of, it has a meaning of one of the meaning it has learned, but it will never think of this new meaning. Then it might create more difficulties to learn this new meaning that's yeah. all yes yeah, yeah. So, so really this one is really dependent on your data set you can see over here this zero shot uh stuff didn't do too well for very very specialized data sets i think if you fine tune clip on that it might also perform worse than if you train it from scratch for some of them for some but but of course this one really depends on the kind of data set and the kind of task and you should never use clip for like stuff like counting um uh, recognizing distance i think this one it's because in the vision transformer model itself, you already lose this information. Like you need a model that can capture all this in order for it to work well. So I would say the issue for some of this data set is vision transformers don't capture the required properties for this data set classifications. Yeah.
So this is a difficult topic because uh, we don't know the full answer for like uh, for, for this, but Clip does provide a very good baseline. So it's just like ChatGPT provides a very good baseline for a lot of tasks. You can fine tune on specific tasks as required. So an another thing is that, you know, when you talk about similarity between like the text and the image, you know, there could be many different things that you could use for similarity. So like one is that you can say that, oh, it's similar because of background, like white background, black background. You know, it's similar because of objects. Then you can say, this is a pub, this is a, so like this is like white background, black background. Or it's similar based on like pub, plane, dog, uh, I mean cat. So you, you could do stuff like that to like, right now what is done is like this. Based on the text image prompt, we hope that it's diverse enough. Like this dog image, maybe someone says on the road, someone says it's a park, you know. Based on the 400 million image text pairs, we hope that um, it's diverse enough to capture the full relations of like what this image contains because the image can contain, image actually can contain a lot of information. So we hope that the 400 million text pairs, text image pairs are, are diverse enough to capture the stuff that we need. Okay, but if it's not, okay, what I was thinking of is like this, this is just a single abstraction space of this embedding. And granted, this expression space can be quite powerful. Like what you saw in the earlier demo, it could already detect the background. It could already detect the object. But what if, you know, you want to have a different abstraction space that, you know, does something else. Like for example, you could have a different abstraction space for like that focuses right on objects. Like you want to do object counting here, or you want to do like, um, distance finding, you want to do like other things that, you know, maybe your encoder is different here because certain kinds of tasks you need to encode differently. So your image encoder might be different here. Your text encoder might be different here. And yeah, I was thinking, is there a way to, you know, do multiple abstractions in this? Uh, one way is to make very diverse prompts here and, you know, create a different embedding space or rather you can use the same embedding space and then if you prompt your prompts diverse enough, this could be updated well, that's one way. Another way is what you see here. You specifically only do background for this, specifically only do objects for this. So if your task wants background or wants objects, you can invoke the right abstraction space here to compare. So this is basically like comparing the abstraction space based on your task. So, I'm still thinking about this, but one thing is that if you compress all the various notions of similarity into the same abstraction space, you may get conflicts because certain idea of similarity might be like, oh, a background is black. But then certain notions of similarity might be, oh, the, uh, it's a dog compared to a cat. So if you want to do that, then what will happen is that your vector here will be very rich in terms of what, it's, um, what, what it represents. But it may not be accurate for very, very specialized kinds of uh, similarity. Like for example, you want to find out whether like how many objects there are, you know, um, that may not be well represented in this kind of embedding space because maybe your embedding space is talking about generic images, but maybe you need a separate embedding space that can do objects or uh, like counting objects and so on. So this is something that I think is lacking right now, especially for image encoder. Like can we encode differently? To, ex to get more information. Like for example, we are lacking the position encoder. Could we encode position in a different space so that we have a different space here just for position and we have a different space here for like semantic match. So, okay, maybe the example I gave here like background objects. At first I thought it couldn't do, I thought Clip couldn't do that. But after, after I tested it, I think Clip embedding space can do all this already. So. Maybe this could be something like, you know, more like overall semantics. And then over here, this one could be like specialized tasks. Like for example, counting. Yeah, you could have a different abstraction space for this. So I'm still thinking about this, but you know, one thing is that if you just only use one abstraction space or one embedding space, there's always this issue that this embedding space is overloaded. There's also another issue that this embedding space doesn't capture everything. So if you split it up into like task specific or like objective specific embedding spaces, maybe it, will, it might work better. 
So I don't have the full answer to this, but one thing I do know is that comparing similarity between text and image is a tough problem because different kinds of um, ways of expressing your image can, can I mean, you, you one image can map very well to different text prompts, not just one. Yeah. What, what is similar to one task might be different for another task. So this, this is something that, you know, if you can split into multiple abstraction spaces, you might mitigate the problem that, oh, this task conflicts with another one. Or like this uses, maybe this part of the green here uses a different input space compared to the one in the yellow. By splitting up into different abstraction spaces like that, you can effectively gather different inputs and process them separately. And then once you map them to this embedding space here, you could then like maybe go through a join model or something. Yeah, so this might be better if we could, you know, if like we can split up our our view of similarity into multiple different like subtasks, or we can do each subtask as a different embedding model and can use them in a joint manner. So these are just some thoughts I have. You all have any other things to add for this? Okay, if not, let's, uh, okay, now it's, oh, I exceeded time a bit. Let's go on to the last slide. So this is some questions to ponder. I, I think this whole idea of clip is a very good one. I'm still deciding about like how to like, improve on it for like the different attraction spaces. But for now, at least for generic tasks, I think it does quite well. So the first question is, what does it mean to be similar in image space? Because, you know, an image can like, it can be similar by background. It can be similar by, um, similar by background, similar by objects, similar by distance, you know, similar by uh, presence of a tree, you know. How do you define similar? And I think this, there's no good answer to this because it's just so many ways to classify similarity that just one generic notion of similarity is difficult. Okay, but one thing- why, why do you need just one generic? Why can't you give a context? Correct. So over here, we have the image encoder only. This image encoder, the context, all this is all from the image itself. You can see that over here, there's no text component. So this might be one way to improve clip, actually. If you can give the image some context. So if you have a text branch here that gives the context, maybe you can interpret the image in a different way. So examples of this kind of text image things are like visual question answer. Like for example, lava 1.5. Yeah. So maybe, maybe if we can give some context to the image encoder, it will be able to match the similarity better in this embedding space. I think it has to be like, by definition, it has to be because there are so many different ways to interpret, right? Then it had, if you want like a precise metric for similarity, it has to be context independent. Just like just like attention in the transformer, like you, you can't just give in view just one meaning for, for some word when the word is by, by definition it has so many different meanings. So how do you measure similarity? It has to have the context. Mm, I, I agree. So this image encoder is, is just a naive view of just encoding the whole image into some abstraction space without the context. I mean, the context, they can derive slightly from the picture. But at least for ImageNet, you can see that because this image uh, encoder doesn't have the context that well, they have to use tricks like ensembling the text encoder in order to, you know, try to match a generic oh. image, how, oh. how an image might look like in order to get better accuracy. Oh, sorry, how is the image encoder trained again? I am like uh just a vision transformer um model. Oh basically. yeah, then then the the context should come from there. So the context should come from there. Yeah, you mean the context for the image. Yeah, but the context for the image might be beyond the image itself, you know. Like if I give you an image but I tell you this is at the beach versus if I tell you this is at home, you might interpret the image differently. Right. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of images. Yeah. So, so I have. I'm saying like when they when they script the images from the internet, they, if there, there there has to be some, some form of labels to inform, to inform the the context. That will be the caption. So that that will be up here. But the thing is, when they did the image encoder here, 
it's just a pure image based um interpretation. There's no I find that, I find that problematic. Yeah. So I do think that this is one of the improvements that can be done to clip. More context based, more that's why I put this question here. Like, how do we know all this? We need more context based processing. That's one. Also, we need more notions of abstraction spaces for image. Okay, we need like position, jack, scene, overall. Yeah, because just processing the image itself, like there's so many ways to process the image. Like you just have this one generic pipeline to process it, you only get one generic thing. That's why the embedding space for an image is a bit more of a now I now I can answer my own question about why you know they need to ensemble the prompt like this one. Like why why a specific text embedding doesn't work too well, all right? And why ensembling improves by three to four percentage points? I think the answer is because of the image encoder, actually. Image encoder is more of an ensemble of, of a lot of different things because no, we don't have the context for this. So we have to ensemble everything in the image encoder. I want to ensemble the text encoder so as to match the distribution of the image encoder. So I think this is why ensembling works so well for this. And I was actually quite confused about why ensembling would work because like, it just feels like if you describe the image better, you know, you describe the class better, it works. You don't have to ensemble all the text. But maybe it's because this image encoder is also an ensemble of all the images because of the way the encoder is done for vision transformers. That's why the ensembling method works for image now. Mm. Yeah, but one, this is a very pertinent problem. I think this problem is not solved. I think the way that we do image processing right now is just narrowly confined to just one pathway. And that pathway leads to one embedding space. It, but you know, if you vary the pathway a bit, you vary the inputs to the abstraction space, like you focus on object, focus on position, you get different abstraction spaces. And then you get different notions of similarity. So it's something like the slide before that. What if you could have different objectives or different abstraction spaces for different contexts? I mean, maybe you could prompt the context here as a text, but there are some cases whereby you need to change the inputs as well. So this only works for some, but there are some cases that you need to change the inputs. But overall, I would say that being similar in image space is not just one embedding space. I think that's very hard to encompass everything. You probably need different embedding spaces with different inputs, um, different ways of doing contrastive learning to get that embedding space, and so on. Yeah, do you have anything else to add, Terry? No. Yeah, so I think this is difficult. This is difficult. I don't have the full answer to this, but I do know that the current method of doing it loses out certain stuff like position. And this is something that you know, if you look at the current systems, like recently I did the Red Dead Redemption uh, agent, that one they had to put in um, additional things to, to match the position by doing object template matching. Uh, app agent, app agent had to use the XML code for position. So clearly there are some things that are lost when we do the image embedding. And, you know, this is also in line with like similarity, like how similar is an image you can only do similarity based on what your, your image encoder model can represent. So there are, like right now, we only focus on one, but there are so many other things that we can focus on. I think that needs to be done for images. Okay, second question. Why would someone use image embeddings to find an image? Why not use, like for example, if you have a picture of, a, of an apple, why not you just say this is a picture of an apple and then I do text matching to it by user query. So the user queries apples, and then I can find out that I can give him the picture of the apple. Why do I want to use image embeddings to match to an image? You have any idea why? Why this might, image embeddings might be better? Okay, so- other than, other than just matching, if you have the embedding or image, you can do a lot of downstream tasks, right? Yeah, yeah, that's one thing. So one thing is, if you were to abstract out your whole image, like this apple here, if you were to abstract out your whole apple into just one text, which is called picture of an apple, no, you lose out background color, um, the, the kind of color of apple. Uh, is 
any objects near the apple. So you might miss out all this because you abstract away the one text prompt. And you know, a picture speaks a thousand words or even more. Uh, if you want to convert this picture into a text, you ultimately lose information. So image embedding, although not perfect, it contains actually more information than text itself. So if the user wants to find out, oh, I want an apple with black background. If you just use picture of an apple, you will not be able to give that user that information. So at least in the experiments I tested with clip, you know, backgrounds and objects, it works pretty well. So if you give the image embeddings and you match it to the text embedding by clip, you will, you will in general get a better match. And I've seen in like NeurIPS, uh, ICML, a lot of different conferences, people use clip to do robotic tasks. And it works quite well off the shelf. They just take the clip encoder for image, clip encoder for text, and then they match the robot's uh, visual system to like their plan. And it works pretty well. So I, I would say that the image embeddings are very useful. So if you have this clip system and you want to build it to like do a retrieval over images, I would say use the image embedding directly. Don't bother converting to text description because you will definitely lose information by converting out to text. Yeah, uh, any other things to add before I move to the next one? Okay, next question. Clip is trained with the text and image encoder from scratch. So the vision transformer from scratch, the GP2 is from scratch, at least based on what I read in the paper. Why not start with pre-trained text embeddings? Or, you know, in, in the case of vision encoder, pre-trained image embeddings. So why not we start with one and then try to base the other off the trained embeddings? So like, for example, if you train your text embeddings, you will better match your pictures to the text that you want because the picture will be forced to match whatever that is learned, try to bet, do a close match, then learn both from scratch. Okay, so I would say that um, in this case, maybe if you just start off with a pre-trained text embedding, you might constrain the model by saying that, oh, there are certain things in an image, but it's not able to represent by text, but we kind of forgo those because we want the best match to the text and the text doesn't have those. So we, we throw away those. So maybe if by training from scratch, you learn better features that are, common to both image and text, okay? But I think for a specific use case of like, if you are just finding pictures based on text and you know, you kind of know what kind of text you want to ask already. Then if you start off with the pre-trained text embeddings based on the model that's already been trained on, on such text, like for example, chat GPT embeddings, you know, you actually get, I, I think you will learn much faster. So same thing, if you really want to learn certain kinds of image embeddings, maybe you learn this, from some like curated data set, you already know the features you want. Then you try to best match the text to those features. Maybe it will work better like that. So I think if you start with pre-trained embeddings, and in fact, if your pre-trained embeddings are from next token prediction or next image prediction, I think you will learn very fast. Yeah. So you already do some form of self-supervised learning on the text domain and the image domain. And then you try to match these two abstraction spaces together with constructed learning. I suspect you will learn very fast. So this is something that I think can be done in future versions of Clip. Like you base off the encoders, not from scratch, but based on a self-supervised learning objective for each domain. Yeah. A a any comments on this? Okay, so the last question is, uh, will better text and image encoders help with better abstraction spaces? I mean, the short answer is yes. <laughs> so if you use like GPT-4 for your text and you use a better model other than vision transformers, maybe a model that can take into account positions, you know, it, it might give you a better representation space in your latent space. Uh, just take note, this latent abstraction space, this is a function of your input space. So if your input encoder loses all this information by encoding them in a certain way, your abstraction space has no way of getting those features back okay, if the features are not related to the other features. So how you process your text and how you process your image will ultimately lead to how the abstraction space is uh, characterized. And you know stuff like distance, object counting, all this may be lost uh, if you don't have the right abstraction space or the right image and text encoder to do it. Or in fact, not just an image and text encoder. Sometimes you want like cognitive functions. Okay, maybe like stuff like counting, maybe that is not an abstraction space. Maybe that is an external cognitive system. So 
yeah, this this abstraction space right now, uh, the the key point I want to make is that whatever you input into your whatever output that your encoders come, text or image encoders, this will ultimately lead to how rich your abstraction space is. So if you lose information in this encoder, you will definitely lose information in the abstraction space. Okay, so the answer is yes for this. Uh, will the dimension of abstraction space help? Okay, so as you saw in text embeddings, uh, larger dimensions can encode more information. Okay, so like the text embedding large by OpenAI is the best performing one. I think 3,000 over dimensions. Uh, so right now we only have 512 dimensions for clip. So if you increase dimensions, you know, can, can be more expressive. However, if you increase too much, then what will happen is that it might store features that are not really required. So having a small embedding space can also help with compression. So there's no magical answer for this. You just have to try out different embedding spaces and see what works best. So right now, Clip uses 512. I think that's fine. I mean, it works pretty well already. But definitely, this dimension can be further studied. Yeah. Okay, that's all for today. Uh, any other things to add before we end the session today? Okay, all good. So I think Click overall is a it's quite a good model. Uh, it uses online text image pairs in the wild, tries to do cosine similarity to it, uh, maximizes the cosine similarity row wise and column wise for each of them using uh, cross entropy. So in the paper, they actually say that um, it uses some form of info NCE loss, but it's actually similar to cross entropy. The idea is to maximize this uh, term here and minimize the other terms. Okay, so there's a lot of things that um, Clip does right. And one key thing is that they use text knowledge to augment the labels. And you, know, you can use this to do generic feature mapping of your image. You not only can map classes, you can map actions, you can map uh, you, you can even map like um interactions of the image, you know, as long as in the wild there's some captions that that do this kind of thing, like a man walking in the street. I'm sure you can match that to the images as well. So that is something you can't get from classifier models. It is quite good out of the box zero shot for data sets that are very close to the images in the wild, as well as uh, if your data set is not too specialized in the sense that you know, the things you want to predict are quite far apart in terms of abstraction space. Like you don't just want to predict a spoon with like one cm, spin two cm, spin three cm. You don't predict those things, but you predict what's the difference between spoon, fork, knife, those is okay. So if your data set is more generic, the distance between classes in the abstraction space is quite high, then Clip will work off the shelf quite well for you. So I, I quite like Clip actually. And I think improving the image and text encoders Getting multiple abstraction spaces, all this would definitely help to improve Clip's performance. And yeah, I would like to conclude with that. And yeah, thanks for coming. Okay, bye.